but the cases have been severed. So on April 3rd, like I said, the countdown continues. Lori Vallow-Daybell will be on trial, charged with those murders, facing the death penalty, which in this country we reserve for the worst of the worst. For instance, someone who might murder their own children, someone who might murder an innocent woman so she can marry her husband and run off to Hawaii with a bag of insurance money and tell people uh, that her children are being abducted by some cult. Yeah, that's, that's, those are some of the allegations. This is a wild, wild story. But it's a death penalty case, and today everyone was in court. The defense trying to get the death penalty off the table. They don't want it to be a possibility in this case. They want the judge to take care of that, not the jury. So there were arguments today. No cameras, but there were microphones. Take a listen. The other motions, we've been attacking the, the constitutionality of the death penalty uh, for quite some time. There are some motions pending regarding the, the death qualification of the jury, motion pending regarding the, the federal uh, constitution, the United States Constitution, as it respects cruel and unusual punishment. We've also attacked the death penalty for, on uh, state grounds that the Idaho uh, Constitution, uh, uh, that the death penalty scheme isn't isn't sufficiently narrowed as, as it applies to all death penalty cases and as it applies to uh, Ms. Daybell. And so with all those motions pending, uh, this is another uh, set of reasons why uh, that we're asking the court to dismiss the death penalty. Uh, let's go ahead and go to trial without the death penalty is our request. And so I, I set out in our motion uh, reasons why uh, the media saturation, multiple discovery violations by the government, uh, the government's uh, knowledge of my client's mental health status, uh, and just the, the practical standpoint of Idaho has been trying to kill people on, on death row and haven't been able to do it. And they haven't been able to do it because Idaho Department of Corrections can't get the chemicals needed to kill people. And so it's debated right now in the Idaho legislature, well, let's if we can't kill people with drugs, let's kill them with a firing squad. So it's pretty appalling, really, the uh, efforts of of our politicians to to try to kill people. Uh, and um, so, asking a jury to do this, we're we're asking this court to take that option away from them. Don't make 12 people in Boise make that decision. Don't put that burden on them to do what our government cannot do. I have a little response to some of what was argued there. It's, it's not um, the 12 people who put someone to death. It's not 12 people who kill someone. It's 12 people who do their civic duty and follow the law. If you don't like the law, you change the law. But that's the law in Idaho. And obviously, in every death penalty case, they're going to argue the constitutionality. They're going to do everything they can to get it off the table, especially when you have some facts being dealt up like they are in this case against Lori Vallow Daybell. All right, let's talk about what's happening out there. Let's bring in our live think tank tonight. Joining us in studio, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, Noah Pines. Criminal defense attorney, board member of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and fellow of the American Board of Criminal Lawyers. Oh my God. Former <laughs> president oh my God. of the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. He was also vice president of his student council in high school. And he was, uh, var did you letter in anything? Lawrence Zimmerman is with us, ladies and gentlemen. And criminal, de <laughs> criminal defense attorney, entertainment attorney, Daryl 
Cohen, also a former prosecutor. All right, great to see everyone. Did we cover everything, Lawrence? Is there anything else? Spelling bee. Spelling uh, bee, champ? Second grade spelling bee, yes. Did, did, did you win the punt pass and kick like I did when I was eight years old? I was a pretty good punter. Okay, yeah. there we go. All right, let's start here, first of all, with the uh, passionate arguments uh, from Lori Vallow-Daybell's attorney. <laughs> this is her new attorney. They got rid of Mark Means. I don't know why Mark Means is out of the case. Prosecution tried, got him kicked out of the case somehow, some way. Probably didn't like the way that he was uh, on his feet inside the courtroom. But uh, what did you think about these arguments that the state doesn't have the chemicals? They've got some su supply chain issue or something. Is that a basis? <laughs> I, I, all they have to do is get weed, put fentanyl in it, and that'll do it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, that'll do it. It's, look, he has to argue something. Right. And he wasn't exactly the most exciting speaker I've ever heard. But he's got to argue something. And fortunately for him, the court reporters take it down and they don't get his voice. So we're okay there. Yeah, exactly, when it comes to the appeal. Um, Noah, we've got um, the law in Idaho, right? No. They do have the death penalty. The legislature's thinking about passing a law to allow firing squad. And he was all up in arms about that. That's a good one, Vinny, up in yeah. arms. Yeah. Uh, but, he, like, but if they pass the law, these are the people who are elected by the people of Idaho. If they want it, they'll, they'll enact it, right? We've got it in other states. We have hanging in one state, don't we? Do we? I think we do. Clint Eastwood, hang them high. I mean, have they really hung people in another state? I think it's an option. Um, you know, look, it, there is a cruel and unusual argument, right? That's why we don't use the electric chair in most states or I think almost all the states anymore. His argument wasn't very What is the passionate? uncruel way to put somebody to death? If the death penalty is constitutional at this point, right? It's, a, it's permitted. States right. are permitted to I mean, do it. You couldn't it. torture somebody to death. You okay. couldn't prolong death. It has to be a kind of an instantaneous death. Like a firing squad. That's what you're arguing I mean, for. I well, guess which is if, why you, if you hit the person at the right spot, yeah. then it would be a firing squad. But what if it's you don't? And then there's the whole sort of anticipation of it and the pain I would assume there's you know if you inject somebody it's kind of easy when I say it's easy there's no you don't experience what you would experience in a, an electric chair which was you know if you've seen any electrocution which I haven't but I've seen films of them it's hair catching fire pretty, yeah pretty those, I, and I understand what happened down in Florida yeah uh, they had the problem sparky. so so where are we in this case now they're getting ready I mean the case is April 3rd and here we are I it's like the middle of March we're arguing the death penalty still well in any death penalty case where the states noticed it you always go through all the procedures to argue against death penalty gain death qualified jury and you can argue always the constitutionality and the issue with the lethal injection is that they can't get the drugs because the manufacturers are no longer providing it to a lot of states for that purpose. A lot of doctors are opposed. Hippocratic oath, do no harm. And some of these drugs have been shown based on recently in the last few months, in the last few years actually, that they're not, like Noah's saying, quick and painless. They cause excruciating pain. Some people are paralyzed and in pain. So it's not as painless as, that's why it's cruel and unusual. And you know, they're arguing why it's unconstitutional. I did read recently though, to Noah's point about the firing squad, if they do hit you right, it is about as quick and easy as possible. There you, you know go. Am I saying we've got two squad. votes for the firing I'm not, I'm, squad well, yeah, being I'm the way out here. Against death penalty anyway. I so, want to yeah. add to the fact that if she's convicted, the kids were murdered cruelly and unusually. So I sort of wonder what a jury is going to think and what they do think about the person who, if they convict her. Right, right. It, it, this all divide. presumes a conviction. You don't, you, we're not going to execute anyone if they're not uh, convicted. But, Daryl, you bring up the best point of all here. Tylee was, was burned. She was put in a pet cemetery. Her, her remains chopped up and burned. This is sick stuff we're talking about. We don't have an about. eye for an eye. So Benny, what's wrong with life in prison? Justice system. What's that? What's wrong with life in prison? What's wrong with it? Um, have, you, have you read the recent commutations? that are taking place around the country? I've never seen governors, any Governors, governors suddenly have the power to just let people go. They're letting murderers go. I, this is a little more yeah. final for the worst of the worst. I haven't I seen that conspiracy theory blog, Vinny. That's not true. No governor is letting someone who was sentenced to life without parole commuting them to time served unless there's something to show they're actually innocent. I've never seen that before. Okay. And, and, and I hope Georgia, we never see it now. In a, in a, but they have the power to do in it. Georgia, the governor can't even do it. Well, in a Georgia prison, you might die by right. an inmate. I mean, there's so many inmate deaths, and 
um, now even guards are being prosecuted for allowing inmates to kill other inmates. All right, so let's talk about the case now. The case has been severed. How shocking is this? Um, the, the state's theory in all of this is that these two killed a lot of people to be together, right? They had to get her husband out of the way, so her brother shot and killed him. She was there at the time. She was laughing when police arrived. They had to kill his wife, and they got rid of her children to be together, yet when it's time for the trial, it was Chad Daybell who did not want to be tried with Lori. I wonder why. Tell me. <laughs> Tell me. Because he doesn't love her anymore? He doesn't love her any less. He doesn't want to sink with her. He, want, he thinks that he could cut himself off from her, sever himself with the trial, and maybe avoid the consequences maybe avoid the consequences. So what, so what happens, what's her defense? Where, where is this defense going to go? Where do you think KYD it's BMS. What's that? Keep her damn big mouth shut. She'll shut her mouth and they're going to make the state prove it. Just make the state prove it? Yep. Not point the finger anywhere else? Maybe. Probably. I mean, the cases are severed for a lot of different reasons. There yeah. may have been some statements that couldn't come in against him because she made some statements and so if you have a right to cross-examine them. In case it gets severed for a lot of different reasons. Other well, Chad Daybell wanted more. Want he wanted more sedexed. time. He wanted more time. She wants a speedy trial. Well, that's a good reason to sever it then. Well, yeah. they, they just dumped a tremendous amount of discovery, from what I read. Um, Jail the, calls, right, on the defense. So you have to be, you know, it's, it's but a she wants a speedy case. trial. So what? Why would she want the speedy trial? And it's not really that speedy. It's been she's been locked up for years, by the way. Um, but is there any advantage to her by herself? I don't know. It's possible that she thinks in her own mind that the way she looks, the way she acts, her body language, her facial expressions will sway the jury into saying she just couldn't have done that to her kids, no matter what the evidence is. And if he's there, he may very well be the person that the jury looks at and says, well, together they were this, but by herself, she just couldn't do that. Right. Bonnie and Clyde. So, but without him, I mean, they don't know what she's maybe she, maybe. Any, any chance that she gets up on a stand and just points a finger at him? Well, that's what I'm saying. Maybe, that, maybe that's why she wants it to because she's going to try was scared. on him. I was scared. Right. He was the prophet. He was telling me what to do. All right. We'll see. All right, folks, when we come back, we've got a lot more to get to. Up next. In Sarasota County, Florida, Gabby Petito's family looking for a sense of justice and accountability, and they are suing the family of their daughter's killer, Brian Laundrie. What did Brian's parents know, and when did they know it? And what about the burn letter written to Brian by his mom? I, I can't talk about the specifics about the letter. Obviously, everybody is aware that it exists. Um, it was in the possession of the FBI. Gwyneth Paltrow. The Hollywood actress being sued for a ski collision. This is a he said, she said on the slopes. The injured skier claims Paltrow ran into him, causing serious physical harm. I'd like to be vindicated. She denies the allegations and is countersuing for $1. Now, the jury will decide, and Court TV will bring it all to you. The Gwyneth Paltrow ski crash case. Live coverage beginning next week after jury selection. Only on Court TV. Conditions apply. What I need from everybody here is help, because the, the goal is still not met. And that goal is to bring Gabby home safe, all right? And uh, I'm asking for help from everyone here. I'm asking for help everyone at home. I'm asking for help from the parents of, uh, of Brian. And I'm asking for help of the family members and friends of the Laundry family as well. You know, there is a tip line that you can call anonymously. Whatever you can do to make sure my daughter comes home, I'm asking for that help. There's nothing else that matters to me now. This, this girl right here, this is what matters. That is it. Anything else, it comes second to this. We have had no communication between our family and theirs. Uh, it's absolutely absurd. We have. We don't understand why. They were traveling together. At some point, you left there. We know you've been home since September 1st. You know something. And the fact that you're hiding behind your attorney, which we understand your constitutional rights not to speak, 
but that but it doesn't make any sense to us, none whatsoever. The laundries did not help us find Gabby. They're sure is not going to help us find Brian. For Brian, we're asking you to turn yourself in to the FBI or the nearest law enforcement agency. It's about what they did with the information that they have, not just not not disclosing what they knew uh, to the laundries. And by, by the way, they could have, uh, to the Petito family, excuse me, they could have made an anonymous phone call uh, and, and said where the body was located, and, and that would have, would have helped this situation tremendously. They knew, starting on August 28th of 2021, that Gabby was dead. They knew where Gabby's body was. They knew that the Petito family was desperately searching for information, but they did things affirmatively. They didn't just remain silent. What that attorney said in particular is telling. So there's no question that he represented uh, that he was making that statement on behalf of the laundries because he says, um, it is our understanding that a search has been organized for Miss Petito in or near Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming on behalf of the laundry family. It is our hope that the search for Ms. Petito is successful and that Ms. Petito is reunited with her family. That statement was issued with the full knowledge and consent of the laundries, with the full knowledge on the part of the laundries that Gabby was not alive and that Gabby's body was located somewhere out west. And instead, they make a statement saying, we hope you find her, we hope you're reunited giving them false hope that perhaps their daughter is still alive. If that's not outrageous, Your Honor, I don't know what is outrageous. Even if everything that the Petitos have, le have alleged uh, is true, which of course we deny, but even if they are true under the law, there is no basis, legal basis, for the cause of action as it's been set forth. The gist of their complaint is that the laundries remain silent and we are now or I should say the Petitos are now looking to um, somehow hold Chris and Roberta liable for the actions of their son because they chose to remain silent. Some civil cases, a lot of civil cases are about money, about judgments to be righted for the damages that you've suffered. And other ones are about something much more important. This is one of those cases. You've got Gabby Petito's family still looking for some sense of answers and justice for what happened to their daughter and, and, and questions that have not been answered yet and people who they believe have those answers, Brian Laundrie's parents. This suit is happening. This trial is going to happen. And joining us uh, live from Florida tonight, uh, Court TV Crime and Justice uh, correspondent Matt Johnson. There was a big hearing today for this case. Matt, what was it all about today inside the courtroom? Well, you said it perfectly right there, Vinny. This happened in Sarasota, Florida today. It was a Zoom hearing, and it's all about the truth. Gabby Petito's family, they are still asking for information. They are asking for answers. They want the truth, even if a jury has to hear everything and get it out of them when they're talking about the laundries who they're suing right now. So we're talking about Christopher and Roberta Laundry. What did they know? All of the parties were Zoomed today, even the Laundrie's former attorney, now a defendant, former lawyer's attorney, and the Laundrie's new attorney, Matt Luca, was also there today, Vinny. Um, not too much media, Court TV, of course, there. And um, trying to just get information like the rest of them. They did set that trial date, and that's the big headline here as well, May of next year, 2024. Now, the burn after reading letter. We've done segments on this. We've been talking about this. This is a letter that uh, Brian Laundrie had possession of that was written by his mother mm -hmm. involving references to uh, a, a shovel, burying bodies, all of that. Uh, what did you find out about that today? So according to Matt Luca, who is the Laundrie's new attorney, he says that Roberta wrote this to Brian Laundrie, her son, to patch up their relationship. He says that it wasn't on Brian's person, his remains, when his body was found. In fact, he says that it was already handed over to the FBI and the stuff about the shovel may not be actually true. But here's what we asked him in his response after the hearing earlier today. Take a listen. Can you tell us more about the burn after reading notice letter? So I, I can't talk about the specifics about the letter. Obviously, everybody is aware that it exists. Um, it was in the possession of the FBI. 
Um, and so now the motion we have before the court is a motion for protective order where we're asking the judge to uh, preclude its disclosure during discovery. Why? We would expect that if the letter is produced in discovery that it will become public and um, some of the words that are in the letter could be construed certain ways and we would just prefer that it not be disclosed at all. But this and Roberta Laundrie addressed this in an affidavit that was released earlier this month. I know that you've covered it on your show. We have a little snippet of that where she talks about this letter. She says, burn after reading. In short, I was trying to connect with Brian and repair our relationship as he was planning to leave home. I had hoped that the letter would remind him how much I loved him. Attorney Matt Luca again stated to me more than once today that it was in the hands of the FBI and not on his person um, when Brian's remains were found. I still think it's absolutely bizarre, strange, and, and, and I think will be a part of this case in a big way. I mean, who writes a burn after reading letter? And you wanted to remind your son how much you love him, but if he burns it, how's he going to remember, right? I don't know. All right. Um, this case, when it happens, and everyone's inside that courtroom, there's going to be tons of tension and so much emotion connected to all of this, Matt. Uh, what did the laundry's attorney have to say about that? Right. He, he acknowledged the fact that they can't stay out of the headlines, either family, and that it's emotionally charged. He also acknowledged the relationship that these two families had. Take a listen. It's not just a trial over money like you might find in certain cases. Mm -hmm. This is a, obviously a very emotional trial for them um, because, you know, they lost their son. Um, they lost Gabby, who was going to be a part of their family. So it is a very difficult time for them. You have a lot of sympathy for everybody involved in this situation. Uh, it's just such a sad, sad story. Um, and so, so yes, of course, uh, any, any human being in this situation would feel sympathy for both families. Again, we're in a situation where, you know, we may not know all, all the truth, but a jury will hear some of it, we hope, um, as early as next year. And is that what is next? Is, is the trial? Is there anything else coming up? There is a lot of hearings, as you know, as you gear up to trial. Next uh, month and next couple weeks, there is another hearing, and they're going to be talking about that burn after reading notice, whether or not it's going to be allowed in at evidence. That could be the first decision on that if it's not kicked out into the future. Um, and then this is going to go to trial if it doesn't settle out of court um, in, again, May of 2024. But the Laundry family, they really do hope to settle and not go that far. Take a listen. Are they prepared to, to go to trial and face the other family? I'm sure that there is no contact. Yeah, there hasn't been any contact. Um, and I, I would assume that there likely won't be. Um, I, I don't think either family probably wants that at this point. Um, but yeah, that, that, that will be very difficult. Um, and they will be prepared if we get to that point. We just hope that it works out for both families in the end. And we learned today as well, some of that preparation could include expert witnesses. I asked what type, since it isn't a murder case, it's more about what they knew and possibly lies that were told and, and what the damage was done after that. I didn't get an answer on experts, but um, that's something that we could also learn in the next couple weeks. Matt Johnson down in Sarasota County tonight. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. Let's bring back in our live think tank. A lot to talk about here, gentlemen. Um, First thing, um, and I don't know if he's just saying it, but there'll be sympathy for both sides here. Do you think a jury is going to feel sympathy for the laundries in all of this? Heck no. Anyone? No. Bad laundry, dirty laundry. Yeah. There's no way a jury, in my view, would feel any sympathy whatsoever for the family of the man who did what he did. I, I, I disagree. I mean, I... I Look, I've been in tons of murder cases where even the, the victim's family feels for the parents of the defendant. Um, and that's the person who, you know, murdered their child and is on trial. You know, here you have a mother and a father who lost their child. The mom and the dad didn't kill her. Their, no, their no. son did. But, the, and, the, but you know, they, they covered it up. They've obstructed well, they didn't so cover, they did everything I mean, they could to prevent anybody they from finding her. covered up after the, allegedly after the murder. And what mother and father wouldn't protect their son? 
Well, I, I think, I understand where you're coming from with that, but I think there's going to be... Would you step of in front of a car to, to save your child? Absolutely. You I would, would too, but if my child or any of my daughters did something illegal, I would be there to protect them, but also make sure that they were prosecuted in the right way. I, if they did something yeah, like that, I don't believe right. you. You should watch your honor on Prime Video. I don't, believe, you, on, uh, I don't believe that you would walk your child down yeah. to the Atlanta Police Department or any other police department and say, okay, You'd hire Billy, Noah. tell them what happened. You'd yes, hire Noah. I wouldn't say necessarily tell them what happened, but I would definitely turn them in. And tell Absolutely. them to keep their mouth shut. Wow. Absolutely. And yeah. you'd keep your mouth shut. It's Absolutely. A, and you'd get a lawyer, and they'd get a lawyer, and nobody would say a word. Something which is like exactly that. what happened. Well, but, no, but, but, not, but exactly. But that's to your, not first, at all but what to your first question, you know, I, I hear where Noah's coming from, but I think it's different. The, the laundry's actively participated in, it seems like, I don't know all the evidence yet, covering up what happened. I mean, a burn after and the, reading and the letter. Big, and the big, the big allegation is that they misled the parents. They didn't right. just sit back and say nothing. The allegation is is that they put out these statements giving this family false, false hope. hope that Gabby would be found alive. And I think I think that's where they crossed the line if they proved that that is true. Think Tank staying with us. Um, up next. <laughs> On the docket tonight in Miami, Florida, the only fans murder trial, Courtney Clenny made millions taking off her clothes on the internet and having sex with her boyfriend, Christian Ovumselli. But now she is locked up and charged with murdering Christian. We have a preview of this shocking case coming up on Court TV. They did a cell phone download of Ms. Clenny's phone which is gonna contain thousands of text messages. It's also gonna contain content that she would use on her OnlyFans site, which has nothing, nothing to do with April 3rd, 2022, when Ms. Plenty had to defend herself. There was pounding on the door, bang, bang, bang. He said that we'd seen his face and there was no way that he could ever let us go. I survived because I'm a born fighter. I survived tonight, 10, 9 central on Court TV. Two friends found dead and a husband on trial for their murder. Will his unique defense be enough to sway the jury? I didn't see anything like this. Someone they knew with Cameron Hall. All new episode tomorrow, 7, 6 central on... My apologies for being absolutely covered in blood. Listen, you don't have to apologize, okay? That is Courtney Clenny. Moments after she has been brought back to the police station after killing her boyfriend. He killed her. I mean, she killed him, for sure. She's claiming self-defense. She's claiming she's a victim of sex trafficking, a whole bunch of things. But there she is, soaked in blood. For those of you who don't know the story, here it is. A social media sensation, now a suspected killer. 26-year-old Courtney Taylor Clenny is charged with second-degree murder in the death of her 27-year-old boyfriend, Christian Obanselli. The chief medical examiner of Miami-Dade County determined that Christian's cause of death was a stab to the chest. Christian was stabbed as the knife punctured the subclavian artery in his right chest. It all happened following a fight at the couple's luxury apartment in Miami's upscale Edgewater neighborhood. And prosecutors say fights were common in this volatile relationship. Evidence gathered during the investigation of Christian's death showed that since November of 2020, he and the defendant, Clenny, had been involved in an extremely tempestuous and combative relationship. The prosecutor's office would later release text messages where Obumselli confronts Clenny for slashing him with a knife more than once. They also released secret audio recordings taken by the victim. Don't touch me! What is going on? Like, what are you, are you gonna get this mad at me when I'm apologizing to you? No, Christian. But you're thinking I'm doing it on- Drop your ad, I'm drop not, your high pitch. Okay, I'm not doing it on purpose. You're tough Sahara. You know well. The right thing to do is to tell me. Yes, and I am so sorry. So shut up and let me slide you. Officials say their apartment building management received so many complaints about their loud fights, they came close to being evicted. Building cameras captured this fight in February, just weeks before Obunselli was killed. 
Clenny's attorney notes that the elevator video does not depict the events leading up to the altercation. And in a statement said, Obamselli was the abuser, the worst kind of abuser. He would manipulate and abuse Courtney in private when he thought nobody was around. Her attorney claims she was acting in self-defense after Obamselli attacked her. In his statement to Court TV, Frank Prieto states, it is an absolute injustice to charge a victim of domestic violence and human trafficking with a crime. He went on to say, we will vigorously defend Courtney and clear her of this unfounded and baseless charge. This body cam footage was taken the day before the stabbing. Right now, I'm like, I have not always been a victim, but like right now, I'm a freaking victim in this situation. I'm scared to go to that scary. All right, so what do you, what do you, what do you want to say? I, I just, I want, I want to be like, I want to be like exonerated, I guess. Like anything wrong. And, uh, and I want him, okay, the party started here. I want a restraining order against Christian and Kelly. The OnlyFans star first rose to fame as a bodybuilder. My name is Courtney Taylor, and I am about eight days out from my first show, the NPC West Coast Classic. And um, today we're going to hit some back and vice, so let's get started. She soon became a social media celebrity with some two million followers on Instagram, where she frequently posted pictures of the man she's now accused of murdering. This homicide has gained some notoriety since the defendant, Clenny, is an internet social media personality and influencer under the name of Courtney Taylor. Now, Clenny is finding that her fame has a downside. Yeah, you should go, because you just killed your boyfriend. Yeah, you did. She is claiming stand your ground. She's claiming self-defense. I want you to take a look now at her interview after she killed Christian. And think about it. What type of witness would she be? Somebody yeah, we're going to start talking to you now. I'm just getting everything set up. Sorry. I'm not trying to be like, I, I'm just like, I, I just cannot believe the way my day went. Yeah. yeah it's way worse. Than, I just really want to get to the hospital. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk to like you now. I desperately want to get yeah. to the hospital. Right. I mean, either way, so you don't rush, you know, you still wouldn't be able to see him at this point? Obviously, you still right? what? You wouldn't be able to see him at this point, so Why? that way you don't have to, you're still, you're still working, you're still taking care of him, you know, it's process. So they don't I just want to be there yeah. when I can. So, yeah, once, we'll, we'll talk about we'll, we'll talk about that, okay? Okay. Give me one second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Oh, 
let us both tell each other how we start. Let's bring in our think tank still with us, Noah Pines, Lawrence Zimmerman, Daryl Cohen. All right, uh, what type of witness do you think she's Very good be? witness. Absolutely. She's a social media influence, only fan. She is pretty, and she'll be prepared to testify, and she's half his size. I think she'll be a great witness. There was an equalizer yeah. there called... I mean, she, ha yeah. she has a lot of fans. We know that. That's how she makes her money. But that's all make-believe. That's all, you know, probably scripted and edited and filters and this is real life and that is real life and she's not a very good witness I and think if you stab somebody in self-defense you felt like you had to protect yourself by trying to stab somebody else then you're like oh i just want to go see him in the hospital i don't I, get it I, well you're coming I think she's down, going to go coming together down. and she's going to take her right hand and her left hand one's going to have an emmy the other's going to have an oscar and she's going to try to win both i think she's going to be a terrible witness if this is any indication of the way she's going to testify. And if it's not, they still have her. She's coming down from the high emotion of uh, a crazy situation. So now what happened, she obviously is defending herself. Now she's thinking about it after she's come off of that and now she wants to go see him. I, I didn't hear, I didn't hear that guy tried to kill me. I didn't hear any of that. I didn't hear it, Vinny. All I heard was- There she is, there's the mugshot. Yeah, let me go, let me go talk to him. Scratch on her face. And that, that, that elevator video is really bad. Look at the scratch across her face. She Pretty might have brutal. scratched herself. Well, no, but look, and plus there's other evidence that he's tried to, he's beaten her. She wants a TPO. There's a video of that. So I think she's a good defense here. And I think she's a great That's the witness. best video ever, right And call 911. The she's the one who called 911. And she'll be practiced and prepared when she testifies. In reality, she probably stabbed him, didn't mean to kill him, and now feels like, oh my God, my, as, as she's praying for him, um, my whole life is over all right this show's not over when we come back time for tonight's tank takes and uh we're gonna be talking about some wings wings but are they wings that's the question no point. there was pounding on the door bang 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 he said that we'd seen his face and there was no way that he could ever let us go I survived because I'm a born fighter. I survived. Next on Court TV. A budding romance allegedly cut short by a jealous ex-boyfriend. But can prosecutors prove their case without a body? The obsessed ex-boyfriend murder trial. Coverage continues weekdays at 8, 7 central on Court TV. Welcome back. Time for tonight's Tank Takes. Let's get right to our first story tonight. We're calling this one Courtroom Coaching. It's the trial you're watching on Court TV, the obsessed boyfriend murder trial. The defendant's 14-year-old daughter on the stand. What is he doing? Is he sending her some kind of signal? What, what, what is that? Take another look. That's while his 14-year-old is testifying. Let's bring back in our think tank, Noah Pines, Lawrence Zimmerman, Daryl Cohen with us. Uh, was this a signal or something else, Noah? I don't know, Vinny. It sounds like uh, he was telling her not to talk. Mm. And shaking his head, no, that's bad. Sounds to me like he was saying, ferme la bouche, keep your mouth <laughs> shut now. Or the only one here, the facial hair, maybe uh, it was bothering him a little bit, and so he was just adjusting it. Just defending it. Uh, how big of a problem is that? For a defendant who gets caught doing that. Well, I mean, prosecutor can definitely, one, you can get admonished by the judge, but definitely prosecutor can use that to um, talk about him. Argue in front of the jury? Closing arguments, yeah. Woo, the defendant's demeanor. Of course, oh. they didn't know about it until just now. And yeah. what you saw is what you get, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. He's guilty. Look what he did. Now, let's get to our next story. We're calling this one Candy Crushed. A 12-year-old girl went to Walmart, and, and I've been there, and I've been to other supermarkets where maybe I'm a little hungry, thirsty, maybe I have a low blood sugar, so I grab something and consume it before checking out. 12-year-old consumed a lollipop. It was actually a dum-dum lollipop, and now she's been banned from all the Walmarts. My question for the think tank tonight, who's the real dum-dum here? Is it Walmart or is it the lollipop, Lawrence? Walmart, come on, it's a kid, a lollipop. She was gonna probably pay for it. Let's let's move on. Whether she was gonna pay for it or not, how stupid can the PR people from Walmart be? I think we just saw it. 
Wow, Gerald, you actually sided with somebody that I did. For once. Look at that. You, Look said, at that. you had some empathy. Is, is there anything illegal about that when we go into a store and we consume something before we As long as you purchase? don't pass the, the, the uh, cashier? Well, I don't know that she. I, I, I think when I read the story, she took one out of a bag but didn't have the bag with her, but then her dad came and offered to pay for it. I think she was in the store by herself while her dad was doing something else. But yeah, if there's something in your cart and it's a, you know, if it's a banana, you don't want to eat the banana because they can't weigh it. Or you tell the cashier, typically at the store, you're like, hey, I ate the banana. And they're like, don't worry about it or a cookie. But I mean, clearly Walmart has better things to do. A lot of talk about food right now. Let's get to the last one. This is the Wild Wing lawsuit. Um, Buffalo Wild Wings being sued because someone says their boneless wings don't have any wing meat. They have all white meat from the breast. Here's the response from Twitter from Buffalo Wild Wings, who says that it's true. Our boneless wings are all white meat chicken. Our hamburgers contain no ham. Our buffalo wings are 0% buffalo. So my question tonight, what are these that I have tonight? Are these boneless or chicken nuggets? Daryl Cohen. Well, it's a good thing they're not chicken fingers because the chickens are outside without fingers walking or hobbling. Come on. I mean, if there's not a, anything pass the else chicken, we can Darryl. do, they pass sound the good to me. Let me try one. All right, pass them down. What, what do we have here? What are these, Lawrence? Cold. Cold. <laughs> chicken nuggets. Nuggets. <laughs> they look spicy. Oh. I don't do spicy. You don't do I'm, spicy? I'm going to pass on them. Oh, that's but if you look but at that's it. the best tweet I've ever, that's the best tweet response I've ever seen. It was and great. I, I hope the plaintiff gets fried on this one. It's better than Walmart's. Well done. No yeah. more calls, please. Noah Pines with the closer. Great to see you, Lawrence Zimmerman. Great to see you. Get back to all your boards and your <laughs> associations. We'll see you later, Daryl Cohen. Always a pleasure. Uh, folks, we're not done yet. We'll be right back. Before we go tonight, we have a missing child who needs your help. Please take a close look at the TV screen. This is Sean Irvin. Sean Irvin has been missing since March 6th of this year out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, Sean is just 16 years old. If you see him, please pick up the phone, call 911, 1-800-THE-LOST, or you can call the Fort Lauderdale Police Department. That number is on the screen. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night. And as always, please don't forget to hug the kids. I felt blood running down my face. This voice came at me that said, if you scream, I will use this, as he shoved a gun to my face. He was screaming, it's coming, it's coming. And I'm like, what, what? The bathroom mirror right next to me exploded. And then we were flying through the air. He was holding a knife to my throat and offering me candy. He asked me, am I scaring you, little girl? Am I scaring you? Are you scared? They all three took turns raping me. In that garage, I lost my life that night because I will never, ever be that person again. over their head, so I was a little bit leery on, you know, pulling up to my house. These guys, to me, didn't fit in to this neighborhood. I've never seen them. I don't think they belong here. I decided to go around the block, and when I came back around, the three guys were gone. out of my trunk and out of my back seat and walked up to my door. 
And the next thing you know, I was on the ground. And I had absolutely no idea what hit me. I lifted my head and I felt the warmth of the blood running down my face. And this voice came at me that said, if you scream, I will use this as he shoved a gun to my face. <laughs> 